Okay, good evening, everybody. Okay, so we've made it to the 33rd day, and from the looks of it, we have a pretty ambitious um, schedule this evening, uh, so we're going to jump right into things, and uh, we'll start with the Veni Sancte Spiritus on page 247. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, send down those beams which sweetly flow in silent streams from thy bright throne above. O come, thou Father of the poor. O come, thou source of all our store. Come, fill our hearts with love. O thou of comforters the best, O thou, the soul's delightful guest, the pilgrim's sweet relief, rest art thou in our toil most sweet, refreshment in the noonday heat, and solace in our grief. O blessed light of life thou art, fill with thy light the inmost heart of those who hope in thee. Without thy Godhead, nothing can have any price or worth in man. Nothing can harmless be. Lord, wash our sinful stains away. Refresh from heaven our barren clay. Our wounds and bruises heal. To thy sweet yoke our stiff necks bow. Warm with thy fire our hearts of snow our wandering feet recall. Grant to thy faithful, dearest Lord, whose only hope is thy sure word, the sevenfold gifts of grace. Grant us in life thy grace that we in peace may die and ever be in joy before thy face. Amen. We'll continue with the prayer of the Holy Cloak on page 245. O glorious patriarch Saint Joseph, you who were chosen by God above all men to be the earthly head of the most holy of families, I beseech you to accept me within the folds of your holy cloak, that you may become the guardian and custodian of my soul. From this moment on, I choose you as my father, my protector, my counselor, my patron, and I beseech you to place in your custody my body, my soul, all that I am, all that I possess, my life, and my death. Look upon me as one of your children. Defend me from the treachery of my enemies, invisible or otherwise. Assist me at all times in all my necessities. Console me in the bitterness of my life, and especially at the hour of my death. Say but one word for me to the divine Redeemer, whom you were deemed worthy to hold in your arms, and to the Blessed Virgin Mary, your most chaste spouse. Request for me those blessings which will lead me to salvation. Include me amongst those who are most dear to you, and I shall set forth to prove myself worthy of your special patronage Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so nice to see a, a full room this evening. Uh, those that have been joining us virtually online, some of you present here this evening, and others of you joining us uh, online as well. So just a reminder um, of some of the topics that we've covered over the course of this past week. 
in our readings. Uh, St. Joseph is the patron of the dying. The possibility of St. Joseph being sanctified in the womb and his assumption or ascension into heaven. His unique titles, terror of demons and patron of the universal church. So it was always a pretty broad spectrum of, of topics. So we're going to jump right into the, the questions uh, from those previous day's readings. And the first question on page 261. Have you ever heard of the phrase memento mori? Without being morbid, do you think about your own death? Are you ready for death? I suppose that's a good place to start, right? <laughs> good place as any. Memento mori. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Anybody hear of it before? Mm -hmm. Yeah? yeah. OK. So what do you think about your own death? Are you ready for death? It's hard to think about my death at work. Memento mori? Yeah. Yeah. There's some days that it would be the better choice. <laughs> I know some days I pray to myself Lord are you coming back any day soon because I think I'm ready <laughs> this world ain't but I think I am mm. Holly um, two years ago for Lent I had a reflection book and it was remember your death mm. and the sister who wrote it has a spell on her death and so I brought spell and I wrote Got on it, and um, we have one sitting out mm -hmm. you know, as a, as a reminder. So we do think of it, not morbidly, but as a good reminder to be prepared. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They always told us in the seminary, be prepared for three things: uh, be prepared to pray at any moment, be prepared to preach at any moment, and be prepared to die at any moment. So that was good advice. Anybody else have thoughts on this? It's, it's not a morbid uh, concept at all if you think about it in the light of we were created for eternity and the only way to enter eternity is to leave this life and to move on to our hopefully eternal reward. I think it kind of helps focus life if we realize, well, we're not just here for 70, 80, 90, 100 years, um, but we're created for eternity and we might get the shorter side of that number, right? None of us knows. Fatty. I was 20 when I went into the convent, and um, one of my jobs I had was to take care of two old sisters. And they, at, even at that age, they really changed my outlook on death because they, were, they couldn't wait to meet their spouse. Mm. You know, and, and that they would pray every day for their death. And um, it really, it gave, because it was a fulfillment of their life. And uh, it gave me a whole different pers per perspective. And there are, you know, I, I, th I truly believe I am ready, but there are days I'm thinking, well, I don't know if I can leave my kids to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> As a man with children, please don't do that. <laughs> We're not ready for that. You're right. <laughs> yeah, I, I am. I Yeah, I believe in God's plan. He gives us the exact number of days that each one of us needs. You know, um, when we keep eternity in mind, you know, we can't enter into the fullness of the kingdom until we are perfected in the Father's love. And, you know, what we don't work out here with, you know, penance and offering sacrifice and purification, it's going to happen in purgatory. And according to saints and mystics, it's way easier here on this earth than it is in eternity. So, you know... Maybe I'm not jumping so quickly at that uh, opportunity to go sooner rather than later. But again, the Lord has a, a timeline for each and everything under heaven. I thought um, St. Thomas More, when he went to be beheaded, he said to his executioner, Fear not, man, for you're sending me to die. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised he could swing the blade. Talk about a guilt trip. Hmm. Anybody else? Okay. 
Uh, question number two on page 261. St. Joseph died in the arms of Jesus and Mary. Some saints believe that he was assumed into heaven after the resurrection of Christ. Do you think he was assumed into heaven? What about that interesting passage from Matthew 27 that states after the crucifixion of Jesus, many people rose from their tombs and appeared in Jerusalem. Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich seemed to think that St. Joseph's body was incorrupt and in an undisclosed location in the Holy Land. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, happened to Enoch, right? Elijah, Old Testament. Mary wasn't even the first one for that to happen to, so could it have happened to others? Well, sure, it's going to happen to all of us at some point, right? That's the idea of the resurrection of the dead, that soul and body are joined in eternal glory. So, Colin. I, I heard uh, Father, this Father Callaway on the radio today. Um, he mentioned that Enoch and Elijah souls were taken to heaven, uh -huh. um, unlike the other souls in the Old Testament that have to wait for the resurrection, but he didn't think their bodies did. Uh -huh. So I don't, he, he, he always reported that Mary had the singular um, privilege of being assumed before she died, so mm. that they died and then went. Mm -hmm. So in that way, St. Joseph could be, you know, above them as he is in his holiness. Yeah, and that's true because if the wages of sin is death and Mary was sinless, then she was brought up into heaven, perhaps before an earthly death, but St. Joseph with original sin. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about that before, and then I just heard it, probably not by accident, on the radio today. But I nice. It's weird how they got to be first, mm -hmm. but it was just as clear as that. I've always wondered where St. Joseph was buried, too. That thought I was hoping he was going to answer in this book, and he kind of did, but I agree with Zach. Uh, the apostolic tradition doesn't forget what is essential, you know. So we know where St. Paul's tomb is, St. Peter's, you know, where Jesus' tomb is in the Basilica of the Holy Sepulchre. There is none for Mary, at least any tomb we can visit with her body interred, you know, so... I, I tend to think that same thing with Joseph, although it has to be theological opining. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, question number three. St. Joseph suffered much for Jesus and Mary. What are your thoughts on love being a reason for St. Joseph's death? Do you think God spared St. Joseph from witnessing the crucifixion? because it would have been too much for him to bear. St. Joseph, his death comes about as a result of love. Thoughts on that question? Mm -hmm. The one thing that really struck me about St. Joseph's very heroism was protector of the family. And to me, it just seemed like too much of a, uh, a conflict that by his very way he was created and gifted to be the protector, this duty would have been there to try to save and take down his son for the cross or intercept. And I think the Lord knew 
this is my personal opinion, that it was just too much of a conflict with Taoism mm. and just the, what the just and the for Jesus was to be. I just, I, I couldn't reconcile the fact that any father would sit there and let his son be crucified and all he suffered leading up to that without some sort of an intervention on a human level. And he was given that character to be protector. So I just, I, I somehow just can't envision it. So it, for me, it seemed natural that St. Joseph would not be present. So, just a thought. Mm -hmm. Good, I hadn't thought of that conflict of terrorism. I like that phrase. The first time that I read this book, I did it on my own without a group. And I didn't really like this part. I was like, this seems kind of like we're, we're thinking through things we don't really understand. But like going through it with the group has opened up a lot of things. And I, I tend to agree with you that if I was St. Joseph and you told me that you were going to do this for my son, I'd be like, you're going to have to take me out of the way first. You know, I, you didn't bring me here to protect him and Mary for this long. This wasn't even who we asked. So mm. my role is the protector. And it's going to be hard for me to put that role aside at the very end when it matters most. Right. Yeah, so Phil. Joseph, if St. Joseph was around, you would think if Mary could die and then she went to Sub, the mother. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that's pointed out quite well. Uh, in addition to not confusing when Jesus speaks about his father, his earthly father, as opposed to his heavenly father. So it seems to ally very much with Joseph's mission. Um, and his mission, as father says, was to get them, you know, to the cross so that they could offer that that sacrifice together of their twin hearts. Well, as you said before, that everyone has their own time allotment here on earth, and we're St. Joseph. Yeah. And he was only allowed to do what he was able to do up until the point when he did die, and everything had to take, everything had to occur as God wanted it to occur. And by having Joseph present, that would make things a bit unusual and a bit more difficult. So I feel that he, he completed his mission in, in, in God's eyes, and yeah, I wonder to myself as well, you know, he, Father takes up the point that um, artwork is somewhat prone to show Joseph as a, an elderly man. And I wonder to myself, because he's kind of out of the picture before, you know, his son and his wife could that have also lend a credence to like a belief, well, he was a little older uh, because he's already out of the picture, so he died before. Um, that thought crossed my mind as well. But again, that's just artistic rendering of a, an opinion, you could say. Just, just from the um, humanness of Joseph, um, on all the work that he did, you know, with protecting the family and, you know, getting Jesus to his adult life, it just seems kind of beautiful that he died in the arms of Jesus and Mary, I think. Um, I mean, he must have just been at such peace. So I'm kind of like thinking of that as St. Joseph, mm. a very um, kind of rewarding, peaceful, you know, to be in the arms of God himself and, um, you know, because he was a very child first. So that's just the kind of kind of nice. Well done, good and faithful servant. You don't get a better reward at the hour of death than, than Jesus and Mary. Okay, the fourth question. Uh, the title Terror of Demons is unique. In what ways do you think St. Joseph frightens demons? In addition to purity and the humble use of authority, what other ways might men imitate St. Joseph and be better terrors of demons today? Yeah, Marianne. Well, the devil's trying to um, ruin family life, and the father's the head of the family, and he's supposed to 
Chester, who's the one that holds the family together. He's the one that um, you know, provides for them. And, and teaches them in their faith and their, to be an example. And all that goes with being a father. And uh, so, of course, uh, it's, you know, he's a threat. Because strong families are not what the government should be. Yeah. As goes the family, so goes society. But as goes the father, so goes the family. Maybe, in a way. And I think the prayer life, if it has a strong prayer life, he doesn't allow for the demons to be come in. And it just kind of creates a, a barrier that they're not going to. So I think, you know, um, well, all people who have a good prayer life, but, you know, men who have a good, strong prayer life and are really asking um, God to, you know, for all of us to be a model of sainthood, just that kind of helps you keep the demons away. Yeah. My experience, and this is um, confirmed by the saints, that um, kind of the closer to God you get, the bigger the bullseye on your back appears to the demons. And, um, you know, you think of somebody like Padre Pio or St. John Vianney or some of these great saints that actually had combat, you know, with Satan or evil spirits. Um, and you realize that, yes, the the closer to God you get is the holier you get, but that comes with a price tag because there's going to be greater spiritual combat. And let's just say it, there's spiritual warfare very much. Um, so to know that, you know, who we are in Christ and, you know, no evil has mastery over the name of Jesus, well, we can be pretty terrifying to demons if we've realized that it's not our weight, but you know, Christ's weight, and, you know, I think Joseph just gives us a, a great model of that. You know, to be humble is not to be a doormat. It's to know your rightful place. So if we're beloved children of the Father, then we have power in the name of Jesus to not let uh, demons just kind of intimidate us. I think the great saints really understood this. They suffered for it, but I think they understood that. Terror of demons. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. I always think about how um, pervasive pornography and um, through the internet and, and in a boy's growing up and thinking, you know, that this is kind of almost sort of normalized somehow because it's accessible. Um, and, you know, I think this would be a beautiful movement in our society if our young boys were introduced to the model of St. Joseph um, because of his purity and, and being chaste and, you know, and just the idea, I, I don't know that, I don't know that a teenage boy today, well, I mean, not all, but some, may not even be able to fathom that, like, is that possible? Can that actually, <laughs> you know, can that actually happen? And um, it's just, I don't know, I think it's, it's um, it's a beautiful example for young men and boys to see that <laughs> I think just the, na just the name of Joseph is like an annoyance to them. They would not want to hear that that being passed to the young boy. Oh, yeah. Uh, Good point. Mm -hmm. And also, I think a prayer of demons can come back at the hour of our death because of St. Joseph is constantly dying. And it's timing with the most vulnerable debilitated or uh, maybe on medication, you know, we have Alzheimer's or whatever the case may be, we 
totally um, pretended to play, you know, open for people who may be attacked. So, you know, if you want to take it up, you, know, you want to make sure you could be faithful all the way up to that minute. And then <laughs> Good and point. Then And we can always pray for the grace of blessed death and the grace of perseverance, you know. Okay, uh, question number five. Have you ever heard of the Dominican blessed Jean-Joseph Lataste? Uh, blessed Pope Pius IX declared St. Joseph the patron of the Universal Church due to blessed Jean-Joseph's sacrificial offering. Do you see St. Joseph as your personal patron? Like a lot of these people, I never heard of him before. <laughs> Anybody hear of him before? No, not before the Okay, good. I had to Google it. <laughs> you know, the book kind of leaves it, leaves his death sort of mm -hmm. unexplained. Mm -hmm. And even then, I, like, I didn't spend a whole lot of time researching it, but you know, I'm like, okay, so what's the story behind it? And even then, it was like, he got to 36. And it was only, I think, three years or something after he founded the order, if I remember it correctly. But it was not long. And it's like, okay. Mission done. Time to go home. <laughs> yeah. So St. Joseph is the patron of the Universal Church of just take that for granted you know we all grew up with that <clears throat> okay uh number six today there is great confusion scandal and lukewarmness in the church how can saint joseph help us to overcome these difficulties is there anything in particular that you would like to ask saint joseph to do for the church. The fine print is when you ask St. Joseph, you might be part of the answer to that prayer. <laughs> what do you think? How can St. Joseph really help us overcome this profound confusion, which like grows every day more, and scandal, which is well entrenched, and, and lukewarmness, which is perpetually there, like what do you think St. Joseph can maybe help us do to, to overrule those? Well, I was having a confused interest in what Laura said. I would really like to see um, kind of a revival and a renewal in the nuns' children and the families and the view that the family is the first teacher of their faith and the primary teacher of their faith. And not only so in our, most especially in the boys, but in everyone. And in raising children in the faith from the foundation of the family, I think they could see a really different perspective on faith and church and the Bible and the role of um, medicine as a parent in all time. Mm -hmm. So I would like to try to answer that question in terms of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. St. Joseph, give us revival, especially mm -hmm. of families in the church. Yep, let's add that to the litany. <laughs> friend uh, in our in the church we brought me from in the men's group and, and he uh, I guess earlier in his career was in a place that was, had a lot of Mormons in it and he would say you know the Mormons really figured out evangelization and the other guys in the group would be like what are you talking about those people are <laughs> but you know he was, he was an engineer and he was referring to like how family based their faith starts there and then it expands to the church community and then the community at large. And I would agree that that, you know, as fathers and mothers we should probably start to adopt some of the evangelization that needs to occur to our children first, right? And see the family as the nucleus of the church. Um, 
which is the church's teaching. And that's going to take a lot of help from St. Joseph, right? Like I read about St. Joseph and I'm like, okay, I've got a lot of work to do. Um, but, but I would agree that, that we can't see the strength of the Catholic Church or, or its, um, what's the word that, that they use? The uh, lukewarmness. Like the only way that changes is starting in our family. You know, we can't just say, oh, the church needs to become, you know, take a harder stance or take a stronger stance. It has to start with us as, as parents and the heads of the household to explain to our children what we believe. And then the church will be stronger, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Colin. A thing that goes along with the terror of demons, too. Like, if you raise a child right in the first place, they'll be, well, still be, you know, tempted and go through trials, but they'll be equipped, better equipped to handle it. And so less will fall by the, the wayside. Put the fear of God in them, you know, <laughs> in a healthy way. You know, like Proverbs says, the beginning of the Lord, uh, beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. So when we have that healthy respect and adoration for God, it, it, it sets life on a trajectory that I'm not in charge. God is in charge of my life, and I live according to that. Yeah, but right now, me, me, me is in charge. You know, that's society. I was going to say um, encouraging vocation. Mm. That is true. They're being stretched to, you know, between churches, mm-hmm. churches are being closed, Catholic schools are being closed. You know, we need to uh, support all these things. Even like thinking about this question, you know, just this week, for example, you know, Pope Francis came out and said, you know, the church cannot bless same-sex unions. Mm-hmm. Well, I happen to be lashed at earlier in the week when I came out by some people and they of course they always bring up oh yeah but uh, you know the sex abuse scandal and the pedophiles and you know and love and da 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 and it's like I'm thinking about this and it's like you know probably even I mean I think I even read that some priests you know are going against that you know mm-hmm. and you talk about confusion and then mm-hmm. when Zach and I think Connor were talking about you know, family, like in the family, that that's the, what starts the nucleus. Like, you know, I, I've seen kids, transgender kids say, you know, they're telling their parents, oh, mom, I think I'm a boy, or a girl says, I think I'm a boy, or a boy says, I'm, you know, you have been slapped up the side of the head, you know, if you told your parents that night, and then it's like, oh, really, honey, well, let's, you know, look into this. I mean, come on. <laughs> like, um, and that's, you know, I never that's felt why that it's like that. Have to come in. These values have to be, uh, you know, this is not acceptable. This is unacceptable. I have a uh, an eight year old son, and he is, uh, he's an outgoing guy. He will talk to anybody, he will talk to people walking past the house. (laughs) And he comes into the kitchen one day and he's wearing his sister's heels, and he's like, Look at me, I'm a girl. And I'm like, you should be really glad that you're growing up in this house. We're not going <laughs> to take you to the doctor tomorrow <laughs> and make you a girl. You know, I didn't say that to him, but I, was, I like joked to my wife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a lot of people do that. I'm like, he's clearly being silly, right? And clearly. But some people take that. So like, that's why nine year olds don't vote. <laughs> They're testing logic. And like I brought up on Sunday, the Equality Act that they're talking about, where you know curriculum in schools where you have to teach kids in science class that well yes you're a boy but if you want to be a girl you can be a girl or if you're a girl you can be you know I mean that's just out of the question there's a huge I, I don't know 
huge, I think, battle ahead of how we get some of the things back on track because they are so off track. And I mean, parents used to be the center of the, of the town, the community, you know, just kind of everything you did kind of revolved around the parents. Um, and there were three St. Francisco children learning that three St. Francisco's were, you know, good people, normal people, something that you aspire to be now. so many people and they just I just want I just want my kids to be happy. I just want every everything's happy. As long as they're happy, as long as everybody's happy. Well, there's a lot more to it than just happy. But that's not the general, you know, consensus about the way people think and talk. And I think, you know, I, I, I mean I've seen this for years, you know people and I think it's a good thing that you want your children to get the sacraments, but then you know, they, they go to their first penance and then the next Sunday they're not at Mass. Or they go, they make their first communion and then the next Sunday they're not at Mass. Well, talk about confusion. The child, I, like I just think we just have, I don't know, I don't know how you, I worry about it sometimes a lot because I think we're just very askew and how as a society we get back on track is, is an enormous task I think right now ahead of us. Sure is. is. Covid mass attendance declining at rates that has not been seen in years. They were talking about it on the Catholic Channel. Um, mass attendance was declining. Um, past Wednesday that year saw the highest attendance across the country than it has seen in years since Covid hit. So I'm a firm believer of a lot of spiritual warfare going on. For those of us who teach CCD and Susan and I do marriage mentor couples in Catholic engagement mentor couples, we do baptism mentor couples, you don't see them after that. You really don't see these families. If you see 30% of the families fall asleep to mass and stuff like you, you don't. So the question is, how can you get to those families and how can you build that nucleus if there's no follow through? So the question is, what is the follow through on all that? And that, that's one of the questions we also have to answer. But it's just, I think it's one big spiritual warfare going on right now. So it sounds like we have a lot to ask St. Joseph for, just to try to tie this back in, because this, be this could be a discussion that takes us in lots of places. But just to draw it back, the idea is that these are things we need to keep in our intentions. You know, These are things we're passionate about or we see as important. Well, we need to pray about them. And prayer is not a last ditch effort, it's a first line of defense. So we need to be praying about these things and in a special way uh, asking St. Joseph's intercession. So are there any other things, question seven, uh, in the readings that you might like to briefly discuss or mention? Laura. about learning about becoming a priest for all of them to move to be consecrated to St. Joseph. Because as young men coming up and trying to learn how to be models of, of, of Christ and, you know, the, the head of this family that we're all a part of, uh, it would just be amazing for them to, to be indoctrinated in the consecration of St. Joseph. So when I was reading it, I immediately thought of Pope Francis must have just read your mind because I was reading an article and he said not this consecration but uh, priests and he was speaking to seminarians need to really uh, find a, a deep devotion to St. Joseph. They need to be rooted in his masculine model of, of life and ministry. Well I was speaking with the <laughs> there you go. That explains it. <laughs> 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 
one other, there was one other thing um, with the transgender thing, and I won't, I won't just go on a tangent, but there's something really amazing happening, and there are trends that occur, psychologically speaking, in, our, in the world, in life, and um, one, a trend that is now occurring is that many of the population of people who were very quick to, to transgenderism are now having open forums and discussions about how this is the worst, worst mistake of their life. And if you look at the climate on the internet about this, it's called like detransgenderization. And they're actually speaking out about how they want to go back and they're trying to go back. And so a very intentional prayer might be that, that, that God works in those people's lives because I think coming from a person who's made that leap and then wants to go back yeah. may be even more impactful than someone who is of religious, you know, it may be less relatable. Mm -hmm. So in, in a good way, um, there is that going on right now. And it's really, really almost become like a, like a movement of a yeah. whole generation of people that were quick to go there and now are, are going back. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, That's uh, encouraging. Uh, yeah. Um, real quick to add on what Phil was talking about. It's just interesting. I'm, I can't remember where I read this, but NASA tends to, to statistically, like statistically, when children see their mother conceive, yeah. I can't remember. Is this in dead area? No, not here. Okay. okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. No, it has been. Yeah. 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 But statistically, when a father attends mass intentionally, mm -hmm. the children are l much less likely to yep. be the faith the other thing I'm thinking on is we keep hearing you know, the term the masculinity of St. Joseph. But masculinity, like the definition of that, we look out like in our culture, is so much different oh, yeah. than the masculinity that Joseph <laughs> personified, right? And you know, as I think about it in some of the readings, like um, his willingness, his abandonment to divine providence is just so different than the typical male, at least my way of maybe responding. Oh. The first thing I could tend to be about is how can I, or what is my way of thinking through a situation, coming up with a solution, you know, solving things. When I, when I don't go that way, when I rely on providence or, or you know, trying to align myself with his will, when Joseph did that, I think that could seem to be the difference in his masculinity. Oh. So many of us are really Okay, so I'm going to uh, steer us back to the topic, and we're going to move on to page 77, uh, which is day 33. Page 77. I'm going to read through the day 33, which is what we're instructed to do. He made him the lord of his household and prince over all his possessions. A quote from blessed Pope Pius IX. As Almighty God appointed Joseph, son of the patriarch Jacob, over all the land of Egypt to save grain for the people, so when the fullness of time was come, and he was about to send on earth his only begotten son, the savior of the world, he chose another Joseph, of whom the first had been a type. And he made him the lord in chief of his household and possessions, the guardian of his choicest treasures. Our spiritual father, St. Joseph, is Lord, chief, and guardian of the treasures of heaven. Many saints believe that Jesus referred to the greatness of St. Joseph in his preaching. It occurred when the mother of James and John asked Jesus if her sons could sit next to him in his kingdom. The text from Matthew's gospel reads, Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee approached him with her sons and did him homage, wishing to ask him for something. He said to her, what do you wish? She answered him, command that these two sons of mine sit one at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. Jesus said in reply, you do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I am going to drink? 
They said to him, We can. He replied, My cup you will indeed drink, but to sit at my right and at my left, this is not mine to give, but is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus summoned them and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones make their authority over them felt. But it shall not be so among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant. Whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just so, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What are we to make of Jesus' statement? What persons has the Father prepared to sit next to Jesus in heaven? Obviously, Mary, the mother of Jesus, sits on Jesus' right side. She is the queen mother in God's kingdom. What about the other side? Who is that seat reserved for? It makes sense that it is reserved for St. Joseph. It is fitting that God would place St. Joseph on the left side of Jesus because no saint is greater than the father of Jesus Christ. It is a monstrous crime for a father to be poor while the son lives in abundance. Who could imagine that the son of God, who is master of all virtues, would forget Joseph, whom he loved and cherished as his father? Jesus must have spared no effort to enrich him. Seated on the left of Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, St. Joseph dispenses all the treasures of heaven. Devotion to St. Joseph is one of the choicest graces that God can give to a soul, for it is tantamount to revealing the entire treasury of our Lord's graces. St. Joseph is your increaser. Let him increase your intimacy with Jesus and Mary. Joseph is an all-powerful intercessor. We must then be devoted to him. We must honor him and consecrate ourselves to him. In that way, we shall greatly please Jesus and Mary, who consider as done for themselves what is done for Joseph. So back to page 262. We have a few more questions, and then we'll pray together the litany of St. Joseph, and then we'll read the Consecration Day, two pages, and then we'll pray our act of consecration together. All right, so we'll just touch on these questions uh, so we have time for everything. St. Joseph is the Lord of God's household and prince over all his possessions. As the preparation for consecration nears its end, do you have a renewed understanding of the greatness of St. Joseph? Has the 33-day preparation helped you to understand St. Joseph's importance and why you need him in your life? What do you think? I feel like we're kind of be led to answer yes to both of those questions, you know? Does anybody have a deeper insight that they'd like to share other than yes? <laughs> Colin. It, it felt like uh, I think beforehand I you know, knew who St. Joseph was and was pretty familiar with Mary and thought Joseph deserved more credit than he normally got. But in doing this, it really felt like I actually got to know the Holy Family. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it seems odd that, you know, if you go so long Good perspective. All right, as you prepare to consecrate yourself to St. Joseph, is there anything in particular that you want to ask St. Joseph for? Do you feel closer to St. Joseph now than when you started the 33-day preparation? Has anything changed in your spiritual life since you began the 33-day preparation? I'd like to ask for help. <laughs> like the more I read about it, the less I, you know, I, I, got, I reached a point probably about two weeks ago where I was like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't do this whole consecration thing. I don't think I'm up to the task, you know. Um, it's kind of like a, a mountain from far away 
is sort of pretty looking, and then as you get closer and closer to it, you're like, oh, I didn't realize how big that mountain was, how steep it is. So as, as I get closer to concentration, I'm like, you know, this is not just uh, you know a little ceremony. And I and you know I think about the task that I have before me as a father and a husband and a provider and a partner. It's like I'm gonna need a lot of help. <laughs> <laughs> I might have to do this more than once. <laughs> You're not greedy. You're just needy. Yeah. And that describes all of us. <laughs> I think it just really brought home, I mean, it opened up the whole world of St. Joseph, where, like, you asked me before, I said, oh, St. Joseph, yes, he's a foster father, and he's a priest, and he, you know, he's married to God, and he took care of the Holy Family, and he protected them. But, like, now it's just so much, um, such a wealth of information into his life and his virtues and, and just the wonderful man he was. So, like, I, and I, I would really ask Mary, you know, to intercede, not so much Joseph. I, I you know, it just came into my mind, but now I'm like, every day, yeah. you know, just, you know, like, I actually asked Joseph and Mary, you know, to intercede, and I just, I don't know, I, I he's become more of a father. Mm-hmm. Just that I find it so um, um, calling out to, to him to present certain pieces that, you know, have come up with me and, and uh, the carpenter part. I just thought we could have your furniture. I, <laughs> I call out to St. Joseph, like, help me with this. And, and you know, sure, he'll um, got it all together. And then <laughs> Good. Eileen Musgrave, if anybody has patio furniture, needs help with. <laughs> Are you ready to become another St. Joseph for Jesus and Mary? Do you think you can put forth your best effort at being an apparition of St. Joseph for the world? Is there anything that you need to rethink in your life that would prohibit you from being more like St. Joseph? Well, there. <laughs> Should we just pack up now and leave? No. No. Yeah. Does anybody have any other questions or, or comments, insights that you might like to share uh, that we didn't touch on? I just wanted to share one thing real, real quickly. I went over to the Carmelite Monastery this morning for the 8 o'clock Mass, and uh, Father Zeta, uh, I'm sure many of you know him, he gave a very short but very beautiful homily, and he said something that just was like, I mean, I, I often have thought about that in my own spirituality, but I just was so beautiful hearing him say it from the Father. And he said, Joseph was not Jesus' foster father. He said, he was his father. And he went on to explain how when they did, when they went up for the presentation in the temple, that <clears throat> Joseph would have sat in a chair, he said, and that they would have brought the baby and given him to Joseph to hold in his arms, right? And... Um, he would have asked for his name, Jesus, and he said, by them placing Jesus in Joseph's arms back in that culture, that made him legally his father. Yeah. So I just thought that was a very, it was so good to hear that. Yeah, put that way. I think Father talked about the putative father of Jesus. That name never kind of stuck with me, but I think giving the Jewish history yeah. makes that um, more vivid. And, and when I, I never, when I knew anything was needed or anything, I, I always eliminate foster mm -hmm. father. Because yeah, it's not incorrect, but there's a fuller sense of father that we can appreciate now after having uh, done this consecration, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm even thinking of a kid. 
you know, maybe they have foster parents. Do they refer to them as foster mom and foster dad? No, they, they call them mom or dad or whatever they may want them to be called, but many times it's mom or dad. Okay, so we're going to pray now together the Litany of St. Joseph on page 233. Okay, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, hear us. Christ, graciously hear us. God, the Father of heaven. Have mercy on us. God, the Son, Redeemer of the world. Have mercy on us. God, the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us. Holy Trinity, one God. Have mercy on us. Holy Mary. Pray for us. Saint Joseph. Pray for us. Noble offspring of David, pray for us. Light of patriarchs, pray for us. Spouse of the Mother of God, pray for us. Chaste guardian of the Virgin, pray for us. Foster father of the Son of God, pray for us. Zealous defender of Christ, pray for us. Head of the Holy Family, pray for us. Joseph most just, pray for us. Joseph most chaste, pray for us. Joseph most prudent, pray for us. Joseph most courageous, pray for us. Joseph most obedient, pray for us. Joseph most faithful, pray for us. Mirror of patience, pray for us. Lover of poverty, pray for us. Model of workmen, pray for us. Glory of domestic life, pray for us. Guardian of virgins, pray for us. Pillar of families, pray for us. Comfort of the afflicted, pray for us. Hope of the sick, pray for us. Patron of the dying, pray for us. Terror of demons, pray for us. Protector of the Holy Church, pray for us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, spare us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, graciously hear us, O Lord. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. He has made him Lord of his household, and reigns over all his possessions. Let us pray. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, Grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector. You who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, back to page 79. A brief uh, reading. Consecration Day. O God, who in your loving providence chose blessed Joseph to be the spouse of your most holy mother, grant us the favor of having him for our intercessor in heaven, whom on earth we venerate as our protector. You who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Can we just say that? Yeah, I think so. You've made it. Today you are going to consecrate yourself entirely to St. Joseph. A comprehensive program of consecration to St. Joseph has been long in the making. It has taken centuries for the secret weapon of consecration to St. Joseph to develop. It is now revealed, and you have been chosen by God to be the recipient of a tremendous blessing in the spiritual life. You have been selected at this time in history to be a part of consecration to St. Joseph. Do you know how blessed you are? In days of old, saints would have been delighted by a comprehensive method of preparation and consecration to St. Joseph. Their saintly instincts knew of the greatness and wonders of St. Joseph, and each one, in their own way, <laughs> sought to honor him and love him with a filial devotion. But it is you who will be ranked among the very first in the history of the Church 
to live in a tremendous era of devotion to St. Joseph, the era of St. Joseph. The Holy Trinity wants St. Joseph to be more known and loved. You have been invited to imitate the virtues and holiness of St. Joseph's pure heart. With St. Joseph at your side, virtue and holiness will increase in your life. With St. Joseph's paternal cloak over you, you will be protected from spiritual harm. Fear nothing, my friend. Your spiritual father is the father of Jesus, the husband of the mother of God, and the terror of demons. Those who honor their father atone for sins. In word and deed, honor your father, that all blessings may come to you. The book of Sirach. For the rest of your life, love, trust, and honor St. Joseph. Go to him in times of plenty, in times of poverty, in good times and in bad. He will be your guardian, your strength, and your certainty of not being lost. If you become weary, go to Joseph. If you become anxious, go to Joseph. When you are alone, mourning, or tempted, run to St. Joseph. He will never be far from you. He will hear your voice and be your quick defense, a fearless warrior. Your spiritual father will rush to your side and protect you. God demands much from you, but he will favor you generously on this earth and will exalt you if you will, but imitate St. Joseph and his virtues. Never forget what you have learned in these days of preparation. Renew your consecration frequently. Strive to please the loving, hearts of your spirit, loving heart of your spiritual father. Avoid sin and live as a faithful member of the church. Should scandals persist, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, Mary, and St. Joseph. They will never disappoint you. They will never abandon you. They will always love you and be with you. I have prayed to our Lord that he might give me St. Joseph for a father, as he had given me Mary for a mother, that he might put in my heart that devotion, that confidence, that filial love of a client, of a devotee of St. Joseph. I trust the good master has heard my prayers, for I now feel greater devotion to this great saint, and I am full of confidence and hope. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the next part we've already done in advance. Uh, some of you were able to send me your thoughts on which act of consecration you preferred, um, and the majority um, liked the act of consecration to St. Joseph by Father Calloway on page 237. If another one uh, touched you more, of course, when you go home today, you can pray that one too. So what we'll do together is um, recite together that act of consecration to St. Joseph. And of course, in the, the blank line, you'll state your name. So I'll just pause there and we'll all just say it out loud, our own name, and then we'll continue. Of course, as a, a focal point as well, we have our statue of St. Joseph here. And no doubt St. Joseph is certainly present here with us as we make this act of consecration and is desiring, us, uh, desiring to draw us closer to Jesus and, and Mary. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I, Timothy, a child of God, take you, St. Joseph, to be my spiritual father. I am confident that Jesus and Mary have led me to you, to know you, to love you, and to be totally consecrated to you. Therefore, having come to know and love you, I consecrate myself entirely to you, St. Joseph. I want you in my life. I need you in my life. Take me as your spiritual child, O great St. Joseph. I desire to hold nothing back from your protective fatherhood. As the husband of Mary, you provided for my spiritual mother. Thank you for always being faithful to her. 
Thank you for loving her and giving your entire life for her service. As the virginal father of Jesus, you cared for my Lord and protected him from evil men. Thank you for guarding the life of my Savior. Thanks to you, Jesus was able to shed his blood for me on the cross. Thanks to you, St. Joseph, I have hope of everlasting life in heaven. As my spiritual father, I know that you will guide and protect me too. Please instruct me in the ways of prayer, virtue, and holiness. I want to be like you, St. Joseph. I want to be pure, humble, loving, and merciful. Now that I am yours and you are mine, I promise never to forget you. I know that you will never forget me, and this gives me boundless joy. I am loved by St. Joseph. I belong to St. Joseph. Praise to the Holy Trinity, who has blessed you and raised you to be the greatest saint after Mary. Praise to the Virgin, who loves you and wants souls to love you. Praise to you, St. Joseph, my Father, my Guardian, and my all. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So congratulations. We have uh, completed this time of preparation for consecration to St. Joseph. However, you know how this goes. In some ways, it's an ending, and in some ways, it's a beginning. So... Uh, You can take this as a springboard in your own spiritual life as the Lord continues to lead you through the intercession of St. Joseph. And I'd like to remind you um, to read uh, the pages after 80, page 80, um, entitled After the Consecration. And that kind of gives you some ideas and what you might uh, continue doing or consider doing. Okay, well, I'd like to to thank all of you for participating in person and virtually, and I pray that this consecration to St. Joseph is not uh, just of individual benefit to you and to your families, but even to our parish at large, as we claim our uh, spiritual heritage as uh, St. Joseph's parish and school and family. So... God bless you all, and if you're able to join us for Mass, uh, we have Mass at 7 o'clock up in the church, and Ron, did you have an announcement? Yeah, I don't think we're going to be able to do that. Okay. I was going to, I suggested to Father, maybe we could say that for together, but the game was there, it's like 8, 7, or like 6, 42 or something Mm -hmm. like that, so um, we can have our own private session for the kids and do that. Okay. Well, God bless everybody, and I'll see you at Mass. Thank you, You're welcome. <laughs>